Hello, and welcome to Course 102's Day 8 Rewind. Today, we're going to be recapping the A-stable multivibrator, the monostable multivibrator, the bistable multivibrator, followed by the Schmidt trigger. Now, let's take a look at our first circuit, the A-stable multivibrator. The purpose of an A-stable multivibrator is to turn DC into square waves. The A-stable multivibrator is free running, so it has no stable states. And what that means is, as soon as we apply VCC, it's going to start generating square wave outputs. Notice I did say outputs because this circuit has two outputs and they are 180 degrees out of phase with one another. What that means is, one transistor is going to be on at any given time, and at the same time that one's on, the other transistor is going to be off. Which is basically why the outputs, as you can see, are 180 degrees out of phase. Now the transistors and all of these multivibrator circuits we covered today are used as transistor switches, meaning that they're operating in saturation and cutoff. For example, let's look at transistor Q1. With transistor Q1 on, it is operating in saturation, meaning maximum current flow, which means R1, our collector resistor, is going to drop all the voltage. If it's dropping all the voltage, we are left with zero volts or a low on our output. Now let's look at transistor Q2, the transistor that's off. With Q2 being off, there's no path for current flow. So there's R4 isn't going to drop any voltage because there's no current flow, which means that our output on the collector of Q2 is going to be the applied voltage or a high. Lastly, let's talk about frequency for the A-stable multivibrator. Frequency for the A-stable multivibrator is based off the component values of C1 and R2 and R3 and C2. The C1 and C2 values are going to be equal and the R2 and R3 values are going to be equal. But you'll have to reference the formula sheet and the formula that we gave you during lecture today. Now, let's take a look at the monostable multivibrator. Again, the purpose is the same. We're going to turn DC into square waves. The only difference is with the monostable, we actually have a stable state. So, which means that it requires a positive input trigger pulse to throw it out of its stable state to generate square waves. The input diode located at the bottom of the circuit here is going to ensure that we only receive a positive pulse because if a negative pulse comes through, it will reverse bias that diode and will not allow it to pass. Now let's talk about the stable state. One, when it's in the stable state, it will not leave it unless we get a pulse. Our stable state is going to be Q2 is turned on. And like before, our transistor switches with Q2 operating in saturation, we will feel a low on the output. Now that low is also felt on the base of Q1. We can't forward bias the base emitter junction. Q1 is going to be off and its output will be high. The last portion of this stable state is that C1 is charging. That is the monostable multivibrator stable state. Again, the outputs are going to be 180 degrees out of phase with one another because if one transistor is on, the other is off, and your output waveforms will look like this. Lastly, again, we'll talk about the frequency. The frequency, because this requires a positive input pulse and there's only one stable state, the frequency of the input will be equal to the frequency of the output. So if we have five kilohertz coming in, we will have a five kilohertz wave coming out. All right, the, the next circuit we're gonna look at is the bistable multivibrator. Again, the purpose of which is to turn DC into square waves. Bistable, like the name suggests, has two stable states. 
But this one, instead of requiring a positive trigger pulse, the device table requires a negative input trigger pulse to change the state. So let's take a look at the first stable state. The first stable state will have Q1 being on. If Q1 is on, our output is going to be a low because again, we're operating in saturation and our collector resistor is dropping all of the voltage. That low voltage is felt on the bottom of D1 and it will forward bias our D1. If Q1 is on, we know that Q2 is going to be off. With Q2 off, acting in cutoff, that means that there is no voltage dropped across R7 and there's no current flow, so our output is going to be high. That high is also felt on the cathode D2, and that will reverse bias D2, meaning that no current can flow through it. If we brought in a negative trigger pulse, it's going to throw us out of our first stable state and it will throw us into our second stable state. The second stable state, we're going to have Q1 off. If Q1 turns off and is operating in cutoff, that means that no voltage is dropped across R2 and our output is going to be high. That high is now felt on the cathode of D1 and we are reverse biased, meaning that no current can now flow into D1. If Q1 is off, we know now that Q2 is going to be on. With Q2 on, our output goes low, and that low voltage is also felt on the cathode of D2, forward biasing our D2. That is our second stable state. Again, if you notice, our outputs are still 180 degrees out of phase with one another. Now, because this circuit requires two input pulses to create one waveform on the output, we can say that the output frequency is equal to half the input frequency. So if we have 10 kHz coming in, we will have 5 kHz coming out of our outputs. The last circuit we're going to talk about is the Schmidt trigger, the purpose of which is slightly different than the other multivibrators we talked about. The Schmidt trigger is going to convert waveforms of any shape and amplitude into square wave pulses of constant amplitude. But what that means is the input waveform can look like anything like this. And if that waveform voltage exceeds the threshold level, the output will go high until the waveform falls below the threshold level. Now, essentially, the threshold level is the voltage level necessary to properly forward bias Q1 and turn it on. With Q1 on, it will have a low output on its collector, which will be felt on the base of Q2, turning it off. When Q2 turns off, the output will go high because there is no current flow until the voltage level falls below the necessary voltage to forward bias Q1. Q1 will then turn off. Its output will then go high that high voltage will be felt on the base of Q2. Q2 will turn back on and the output will go low again. And this will happen every time the input waveform exceeds the threshold level. This concludes Course 102's Day 8 Rewind. Thank you for listening.